All right, guys, let's finish out this lower extremity with the hip joint. So uh, the hip joint is a combination of the femur and the acetabulum. So this work gets a little more complex. The acetabulum itself is made up, it is the pelvis, but made up of three different parts, ilium, ischium, and pubis. And then also just making up part of the pelvis, you're gonna have your sacrum and coccyx. So let's go take a look. <clears throat> so a lateral view here. So here is your acetabulum right in here. And then in this spot, there's a division to three fused areas here. So the ilium, ischium, and pubis. Those are gonna be your three spots that make up the acetabulum. And if you look over to the left, then of course we have our sacrum, and coccyx. I really like this picture in your Mansfield book. I like the way they shade in, just the, the way it looks, it's pretty detailed. Uh, so you can really start to see where they this glute med, glute men, and all these different hip muscles because it's way more complex than any of the joints we've done so far. So, <clears throat> and I guess here, let's just take a look. Sure, this is why that rectus femoris can have its passive insufficiency. So then for the femur, so here we have the acetabulum. I talked about this with the knee and the menisci, but your acetabular labrum really helps deepen that socket even more. And then that makes it even more stable. So when we compare the hip to the shoulder, uh, both offer us movement. The shoulder offers us a lot more, but to have more movement, you're going to give up stability. So the hip joint is a great combination of movement with a ton of stability. So when we're looking to finish this joint off with the head of the femur fitting into that acetabulum. And I'm going to point out this really important ligament and this area of the hip, you also have blood supply coming through here. So a little bonus question for you is, what is this hole that the ligament comes out of? Because within this ligament, you're gonna have vascular supply. So if there's damage to this ligament, you could damage the vascular supply and then start to get necrosis of the hip. So the joint starts to decay because it doesn't have any blood getting to it. And I'll show you a quick video of um, a pretty normal looking uh, football play. Uh, I know it's a little grainy because it's uh, super, well, I think it's like 1991. Uh, Bo Jackson, if you don't know who he is, he is uh, probably one of the greatest athletes of all time. Um, and if you don't know him, well, it just shows how long it's been since he was playing sports. But a uh, playoff game against the Cincinnati Bengals, uh, just a normal play. And then he was out and needed a hip replacement because he damaged his hip, specifically that ligament in the vascular supply. So simply getting tackled from behind because the guy was holding onto his leg. That, we'll get to a better view here. This might be good. Just pulled that leg out. This is probably the best view. That's it. Took out one of the best athletes of all time. Check that spot out because that's a pretty common tackle that you're going to see. So, you know, depending on if you're working with a patient and they're having some, you know, hip pain that doesn't go away or just, you know, exhibiting signs that are a little different, uh, that's just something to keep in mind. All right, first major concept here. I need to move one of my things out of the way. It's talking about the angle of inclination. 
So this is the angle at which if you went straight through the head of the femur and then down the shaft or uh, yeah, through the head of the femur and down the shaft, you're going to get a certain degree. So normally it's about 125. So you take this, drop that sucker down. Now, if the angle is shortened, if that angle there is shortened, say 105, that is called coxa vera. And coxa vera is going to lead to valgus at the knee. And this is why you should start doing that webbing because that's going to increase the Q angle. Now there's nothing you can do about this hip. Uh, that's just the way you're born. And women are more susceptible to this type of hip, thus this type of knee, thus having a Q angle that is not what we want. So that's your coxa vera. And what this also starts to do, it starts to put a lot of stress over time. If you think about where the force distribution is, we have this 90 degree angle. This is like a bridge. There's a lot of pressure through the neck of that femur. So that can start to get a little worn out. Then if the angle is larger, you have coxa valga. Uh, and I said this could be better because it looks pretty similar to the normal. So um, this actually should be, you know, looking a little more like 140 degrees. But an angle larger than 120, 125 that we have over here is going to be your coxa valga. And that'll start to rub the head of the femur a little more awkwardly because it's not going to be sitting in the socket nice. So <clears throat> those are deviations that are important to understand because that helps us explain why you may have issues in other areas and um, eventual impairments you could have with the wearing down of bone and bony structures. Your Mansfield book also has a good picture of those things right here. So you can take a look at that. That's why this one here, this Cox of Alga looks a little better than mine for sure. All right. For moral, retro and anterior version. So normal is 15 degrees. I'm just gonna have to show you a picture. It shows you what this is. Again, there's not really anything you can do about this in therapy. So, what you can do though, think about uh, easy test question, towing in. So you, people would say someone's walking pigeon toed or something like that. That is excessive antiversion. So the center of the femur is anterior. That's where they get this name. It's not that the femur itself, in fact, what that does is that kicks the femur back a little bit. If the front's forward, the, then the side is gonna be back. And to counteract that, there's going to be rotation that occurs either for whatever, either at, at the tibia or the ankle, the foot, whatever. And that's what's going to cause that towing in. So, and then retroversion on the left, the foot's going to be straighter. And remember, it says you should have some antiversion. That's why most of you, when you stand there, you don't stand with your feet completely parallel. So... <clears throat> You don't want to have it straight across like that. Let's go back up here. So you want to have about 15 degrees. But if it gets too excessive, then you actually start to toe in to compensate for the excessive going out. <clears throat> so I talked earlier about the support structures. The labrum is huge. Helps deepen that socket, increase stability. The joint capsule itself, I'm going to skip number two, obviously, for a second. Joint capsule is going to help a ton with that. And then lots and lots of ligamentous structures here. So let's look at those. The Y ligament specifically is one that you'll see a lot on test questions. Oh, I don't have that on here. It's too bad. Let's just take a look at that real quick. So we're looking at the Y ligament here. It's a good picture. The iliofemoral ligament. It literally looks like a Y. You can see that there. And that is going to be a ligament that comes into play with people, especially if they have either severe weakness or they have a spinal cord injury because it allows you to extend the hips passively so you can rest on that ligament without 
uh, having any muscle contraction. So if you stand up right now and you just push your hips forward into more and more extension, moving that pelvis anteriorly, um, you realize that you could just literally hang out there. So that really helps improve function for weak hips or it might cause a deviation if people are too dependent on it. And it's really good for spinal cord injury patients uh, when they're trying to ambulate. And I want you to look up, there's gonna be a lot of little things for you to look up this time, trochanteric bursa. So we haven't talked about bursas, but bursas pretty much are fluid filled sacs that help lubricate an area. So wherever there's high friction, try to have a bursa there. Uh, those can obviously eventually become inflamed. And a lot of times you get trochanteric bursitis that a patient gets. That's a real common thing you treat in the clinic. So next term specifically, we'll talk a lot more about that. Take a quick look at the open and closed pack position. Open pack for the hip, 30 degrees of flexion and abduction with some external rotation. Closed pack, full extension and internally rotated. Now, orthokinematics, a lot of drama involved in that uh, between people who would say one thing or the other. In my experience and Ling's experience, there are glides with hip flexion and extension because you do mobilizations to those. However, the book and the exams are gonna be based off, well, the exam is gonna be based off the book. So in Mansfield, in my edition, page 241, it talks about flexion and extension being a spin only. So here's an example of where spin will be the correct answer, okay? Uh, however, for all the rest of them, the normal osteokinematic rules apply. So first question, I'm not gonna answer this out loud. This will actually be part of your attendance uh, and student enhancement check and something that we can talk about, but you should pause and think about this question and write it down. What arthrokinematic motions are occurring at the hip during an eccentric contraction of the gluteus medius on the same side? That question has multiple layers and that's why I love that question because it's seeing, can you in rule number one, read everything correctly. Rule number two, can you envision what's happening? So I've given you a lot of details for you to be able to figure out the motion that's occurring, but can you figure that out? And then you can figure out the orthokinematics. Total hips. Uh, then we got some precautions. So depending on the approach. So the precautions are based on the approach and then based on the glide, the orthokinematic glide. So a posterior approach is going to compromise the posterior capsule. So any glide that goes posterior is going to be a precaution. So, and this is uh, one of the reasons why <laughs> there clearly has to be a glide with these um, osteokinematic motions, but for whatever reason, Mansfield is not doing that. So one of the few things I, that I don't like about that book. So a posterior approach, so if they come in through the backside, Flexion past 90 degrees, absolute no-no. I mean, it's a precaution, but I wouldn't push it if it's tight. No internal rotation and no adduction. When I say adduction, it's really past midline. So don't cross your ankles. Patients all the time be like, oh, well, I didn't cross my hip, just my ankles. I'm like, well, <laughs> It's a good chance you're crossing your hip past midline if you're crossing your ankles, just saying. So another question, what motions would be a precaution for an anterior approach? So see if you can do that. You should be able to come up with, there should be three precautions for that anterior approach. I want you to think about how they could dislocate that hip. And then also, I want you to think about three functional activities someone might try to do that would put them at risk of a, delo uh, a delocation, a dislocation and name the approach. So you could go one, you could go posterior approach, you could have an activity, you could have another posterior approach, and then your third one could be an anterior approach. Those are your two approaches. So I want you to think about something someone could do where it might pop the hip out because it's one thing to tell your patients don't flex or internally rotate, but what are activities where you internally rotate and you didn't realize that you're internally rotating? Pelvic tilting, so crucial to understanding back pain specifically. If you don't understand pelvic tilting, you're gonna have a hard time treating backs. So normally, it should look like this guy right here, even though it says anterior pointing down, it's these two are the anterior tilt. 
You got your pelvis there, you got some nice lordosis in that low back, which is also, this could be, most people call it lordosis, lordosis, but it also technically is extension of the lumbar spine. So with a posterior tilt, oops, I'm sorry, with an anterior tilt, the ASIS is going to move out and down. And what is that gonna do? That's gonna cause an increase in lordosis of the low back. Sometimes we want to increase lordosis. So maybe we need an anterior tilt. Sometimes we don't want as much and we need to reduce that tilt. So now we have a posterior tilt. It's gonna tilt back. Your back and lordosis is gonna flatten. It may even start to turn into when the lordosis is completely gone. Now the spine is fully flexed or the, the lumbar spine is flexed. So we've lost that curve, that lordosis. Now it's, I mean, it's kyphotic. So we need to understand that if we're going to be able to treat backs, because what happens at the pelvis is going to affect what happens at the spine, which is going to ha affect what happens at um, the intervertebral foramen and what happens to pressure on the disc and all types of stuff. So we have to understand that. So then we also need to understand, well, what muscles are going to work to do that? So for an anterior tilt, you're going to have the lumbar extensors. Because with an anterior tilt, remember, we're going to have increased extension. So if we're going to increase extension, well, then the extensor should work. So an example, the erector spinae. And then you actually have hip flexion occurring osteokinematically in the front. So this is going to be hip flexion. The pelvis is now closer to the femur in the front. So it's going to be your hip flexors. So your iliacus, so as major, rectus femoris, sartorius, you can list a ton of them. Posterior tilt, you're going to have hip extensors. You're going to kick in. <clears throat> so say your glute max or your hamstrings, if you say proximal hamstrings. That's what the there's a question on the test. Make sure it's proximal hamstrings. And then in the front, we need to have something in the front if we're having something in the back work to make this rotation occur. So then we have our spinal flexors, which is the rectus abdominis. So where does the rectus abdominis insert? On that pubis in the front. So we can start to envision, if you don't know the osteology and where the muscles insert, you're not gonna be able to think about all these other things that are occurring. So when you're doing these, we're gonna ask these questions a ton. So you need to get these right. So really, I look at the tilting as quadrants. And this way is your front. So here's your front. So whatever is in the green quadrant, so let's say your rectus abdominis, then we have to have something on the other side. So glute max. So a hip extensor and a flexor of the lumbar spine. You have to have those guys at the same time contracting to have the best ideal pelvic tilt. Then we need our lumbar extensors over here and our hip flexors over here. And those need to be working. So on your exam, because a lot of you were doing a pretty good job of writing down like your MMT grades for this last exam, I would be writing this down until you have it fully memorized. So you don't miss those muscles. Because the next question will be, if the person is, let's say, posteriorly pelvic tilted, we need to know how to get there. We need to know how to get out of there by, contra by contracting the other muscles, but also what muscles need stretched. So I'm not gonna answer that question, think about it, but what muscles would need stretched if someone was stuck into a posterior tilt and they were too tight to get out of? So this is number four, this is uh, your fourth question. Well, minus that other one that I already gave you uh, that doesn't really have a number, but the SPTA is asked, uh, has asked the patient to posteriorly tilt her pelvis. Now the SPTA instructs the patient to control her pelvis back to neutral, which muscles are working and specifically what type of contraction is being performed. It's another multi-layer question. You're all gonna love this. Here's a quick one on reverse muscle pull where the insertion goes towards the origin. 
So example of that for you is your sit up. So the rectus abdominis flexes the spine, okay? Flexes the lumbar spine really is what's happening. So when people do a full sit up and their stomach comes up to their knees, they have flexed their hip. So that is not working your abdominals. After about the first 20 degrees that you're up, it's all hip flexors after that anyway. It becomes an isometric hold of the rectus abdominis with hip flexors involved. And that's a reverse muscle pull. That's an example. And then we had this on the other exam, but just to kind of ask you one more time, which muscle assists with closed chain and performs a reverse muscle pull at the knee? Remember that? So it's gonna help get knee extension, your soleus. So in lab on Thursday, uh, well, I will have already shown you this by the time this is to the video, so we should have that down, hopefully some reverse muscle pull stuff. So contractures, uh, hip flexion contractures are pretty common. I mean, not that, not that hip flexion contractures are common, but among contractures, it's a pretty common contracture people have. You can still be very functional and have this contracture. But a hip flexor contracture is going to force you into more flexion, which means you have what type of tilt? What type of tilt would you have if you're stuck into flexion? And the answer is going to be, back here, pen, anterior pelvic tilt. So then what is an anterior pelvic tilt going to do to lordosis? It's going to change it. Is it going to do more or less? So hip flexion contracture, we need to understand the ramifications of this, how to get out of it, and what to stretch. So you should be trying to start to put some things together so you can ask me some questions about that. But those are things we have to be thinking about. Now we have some muscle link special tests here. One is the Thomas test. And that is gonna check for hip flexor tightness. I'm going to uh, demonstrate this in the lab uh, so you can kind of see what you can get out of this. But Thomas test, hip flexor tightness. Now we're getting some T's here. Thompson test is for the Achilles. Thomas test is for hip flexion. And then the Ober's test is to test for a tight IT band. Now, both of these are in your goniometric measure book, so you can check those out. But again, I'll show you in lab um, eventually as well. But honestly, I won't show you probably before you take the exam, so you should probably read that. And then I've told you and told you, everything goes back to gait. Eventually, everything builds to gait. So we've talked about circumduction before in a video. So go back and review that circumduction video in the playlist for this class. But the next one is the Trendelenburg. And I'll also have a video link up about Trendelenburg gait. Trendelenburg can be either compensated or uncompensated. And you need to know the difference between both. We need to know what muscles we need to work and why that could be happening. And a total random tidbit fact, but the piriformis is an external rotator that turns into an internal rotator once the hip is flexed to 90 degrees. Because the classic piriformis stretch seems to be counterintuitive to the actions of the piriformis. However, once the hip is flexed to 90 degrees, things kind of switch around on that guy, which allows the classic piriformis stretch to apparently stretch the piriformis. Random tidbit for you. And one last thing, I love these pictures in the Manfield, Mansfield book with the muscles. I think it does a, just for whatever reason, it's pleasing to the eye for me and I can easily see things. And I really want you to be able to, we talk about iliopsoas all the time, but the iliopsoas is a combination of these two muscles. And I want you to really pay attention and see how the iliacus is on the crest and goes down to the femur a pure hip flexor. The psoas major starts on the vertebrae. So it actually crosses multiple joints and could be passively insufficient. But also, because of that, has a direct connection to changing lordosis of the lumbar spine. So when we say iliopsoas, that's okay if we're talking about hip flexion and stuff, but we need to be able to differentiate those and understand what each one could do if contracted in isolation. And that is your lecture on the hip. Make sure to read that chapter, check that PowerPoint out. Uh, and if you don't understand these concepts, you need to talk to me because they're going to be throughout the rest of the program and answer those four questions. And we'll talk about them uh, in class or if you ask me about them.